Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Everything Imaginable. I am your host, Gary Cacciolillo. And before we get started, I want to thank everybody for listening and also thank the contributors to my show, who are Candace Anderson, author of The Reluctant Messenger, and Joseph Sinkovic, author of How to Kiss the Universe, Ms. Aida, author, psychic, spellcaster, root worker, and witch. And you can find her at Ms. Aida.com, M I S S A I D A.com. And this episode is being sponsored by Ginger Glasser. And you can find Ginger at tarot by Ginger.com. She's a tarot reader, evidential medium, and healer. And I highly recommend her for her readings because she is very thorough. And now, without further ado, our guest today is the return of our monthly co-host, the living legend, Jared Murphy, author of It's Not Aliens, It's Worse, It's Us. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Been too long. Way too long. I apologize to all of our listeners. Um, I hope Gary and I do not uh, make uh, this uh, break long again. We were just in, I say, transitional ether. It happens. <laughs> but we are both still alive and doing our thing. Yeah, that's true. There is uh, so much to go over, so much to talk about. Where do we even start? Hmm. What do you think about them shooting down balloons? Oh, I suppose that, uh, you know, I thought about the same thing everybody did about, hey, why not take her down in the middle of the, you know, desert or country or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the thing we'll never know until the movie comes out is like, what if it did have a payload of anthrax or you know, what if there was a biological weapon or, you know, what if it wasn't nuclear? What if, what if there was a, a deterrent, you know, mm-hmm. we're never going to know. And then the people who took care of it for us, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're everyone's going to continue to speculate. Like, why not, sh- why not pop the, bu- and who doesn't like popping balloons, right? Oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, and then, you know, you get told you can, you know, shoot it down with half a million or a million dollar missile. It's like, well, you know, you really kind of want to do it. So you think it's just doing it for fun. (laughs) You know, well, at this point, you know, it's like, ooh, we saw another one. It's now it's like bubble wrap. Well, I'm sure these things have always been there. Well, there is the funny thing is that what if they have been or like, what if it's turned into something like the Hindenburg where they used to be smaller, but then they just kept getting bigger because nobody was shooting them down. Mm hmm. Um, but then again, you know, there's certainly um, astrological, I can think of a couple instances and also meteorological balloons. I mean, it, it is a thing to put them up. So yeah. uh, uh, did we just shoot down like five colleges balloons, you know, and, and, and now that it's a bad thing to have a balloon, no one's going to say, well, you just wiped out our our million dollar balloon that was doing, you know, hurricane weather pattern research, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, I'm assuming all those are registered, but I don't know how they track that stuff. Um, yeah. And I, I don't, I do think that I guess maybe the full circle concern is I, I feel like it would behoove us to, have manufacturing facilities everywhere again Hmm. you know i mean we're moving into it's not a matter of moving into we have a we have a global economy for products um oh i suppose we can actually talk about this but did you catch the owner one of the founders of apple discussing uh follow this hypocrisy did you see him criticizing Elon Musk for the Tesla and its capabilities from a founder of a company that records and takes all of our personal data and our voices and 
does whatever they want with it. I didn't see that. No. Yeah, it came shortly during around the Super Bowl here. Um, but what blows my mind is that this is also a company whose products are built under absolute terrible conditions in the poorest countries. And, you know, we, we it's just, I, it's astounding that that person, you know, criticized. They don't actually have an active program to pay the people in the factories a living wage in many locations. It just blows my mind. Hmm. Not that we're off on a, that kind of a digression, but it, it blew my mind that um, someone who's all, all to me, I'm not saying everything, anybody at anyone who's created a company doesn't do things the right way. I'm not right. saying it about Elon Musk. It's just that you have someone who's clearly out of the box and rubbing the powers that be the wrong way. And, but it is astounding to me that anyone at Apple would open their mouth about what's fair and right within an organization. <laughs> I, I, oh. It's just mudslinging, man. It's, I don't know. I, maybe they're, they're afraid of Elon, maybe. I, you know, so of all things, I'm going to tell everyone I learned this on PBS or on, um, well, the local affiliate um, radio was discussing that when a kilogram of anything is brought up in payload in, in, in any rocket that NASA is putting up, in general, the payload cost was 50 to 55,000 a kilogram to bring any payload of anything into space, mm -hmm. a kilogram. I think everyone needs to look up how little that is. And with the latest um, passenger rocket that they're going to test, the, the payload is, uh, it came down during SpaceX to about $1,000 a kilogram. That alone is incredible. The numbers now are indicating a hundred dollars or less for the same kilogram. That that we've gone from fifty five thousand dollars to less than a hundred. It means that for everyone listening, obviously that's not a pound, mm -hmm. but less than a hundred dollars a kilogram from fifty five thousand means that we're looking at numbers that I think can put things in space that are going to allow us to build larger things in space. So I, I, and this is a private company and I think it is scary or, you know, imagine you and I are sitting around going, Hey, you know what, you know who we're going to compete with? We're going to compete with NASA. <laughs> like that's just not a normal um, goal. And so I think there's going to be a lot to unpack over maybe hundreds of years or future business um, history where, you know, how do you go from nothing to being a successful private space company? I mean, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, obviously the next thing that we have to start doing is building bases and colonizing things space because two, for space exploration I think it would be much more efficient to actually build in space itself. So that way we don't have to use up all the fuel to get past Earth's gravity. It would make much more sense to be launching off of the moon than it does to be launching off of Earth. So if we can go to the moon and start manufacturing the minerals and the metals and all the things that we need to build spacecraft there and launch from there, that would be fantastic. I mean, I think that's the only way we're really going to be able to do any type of significant space exploration, exploration with human, with actual manned human aircraft. Yeah, I don't think, um, you know, I know these conversations cycle and I know I, I get, I have, it's wonderful to have uh, fans and people interested in the topics reaching out to me and, 
one of the things that got brought up was the stories of, you know, there was encounters on the moon and mm -hmm. with perhaps aliens or, you know, leftover World War II people. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and we were told not to come back to the moon. And you 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 know, so like not to go right down the conspiracy rabbit hole, but the the reality is that why didn't we stay or and again it's 50 it was 55,000 a kilogram so the realistic ability for us to build anything on the moon may have been just economically not possible because for all you cynics out there yeah we were putting the money into other secret programs and uh wars and things on the planet that there just literally wasn't the financial um there just wasn't uh there was no endurance within our financial system to maintain the systems on the planet and to do you know a moon base but it has always been kind of curious to me that we you know we we put up the space station and then we never we never even circled around the moon again until recently isn't that odd yeah it's very odd very very odd i mean if you look at the things from you know what um john lear used to say about bases on the moon and um edgar mitchell talked about you know them having you know bases and extraterrestrial stuff on the moon also I don't know. I mean, are we already, do we already have those bases on the moon? Is, right. Is, is that what we were doing in the first place? And they didn't yeah. really tell us because it was uh, a black operation. Right. It was just something that they were, you know, that, that is the other whole course of thought that they did go to the moon. They did stay there and they have used it. I, I, I find it fascinating that there's no, we could, Here's, our, here's another way to fill up the hours to talk about education. <laughs> and, I'm against education. Well, fortunately, they're not really doing it, so we're right. doing really well. Um, <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't out the city. I, in fact, I, um, I just read an article this morning that there was a school system that 23 schools, the majority of the students can't, uh, they don't understand basic math. Mm -hmm. And I don't... I don't know how many more things we got to go through to like probably look at um, educational leadership and make it make a huge sea change. I guess no point in saying huge, a sea change with education. But it's not like um, as you learn space, you learn uh, for all of those out there. If this is even a, in the curriculum now, it's you may or may not even learn what the planets are in our solar system, let alone where I'm going, which is what about all the killer asteroids and meteors that are uh, in our ellipticals and mm. uh, to the solar system, to the planet? Um, we are not familiar on an educational level with celestial bodies that are an issue. Instead, we're, we're fighting inter-country. And I kind of want to move into more of a, a Robotech scenario. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that now. We're talking 1980s Robotech. Are you familiar? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I always call it for people who do or don't like anime. Robotech was a um, an American uh, production of what they of three different Japanese anime series, which they smashed into a what they called a first, second, and third generation about an alien spacecraft. Uh, America or America, the world is at what it's doing now. They're fighting. They're disagreeing. They're having their conflicts. And this massive spaceship crashes on an island and everybody went, oh, wait, maybe we should worry about something bigger than us. So the world government program really gets going. They rebuild, re-engineer. I would say it's like the Star Wars. I think it's like the Star Wars of anime. I mean, even those, I mean, I was a fan of Star Blazers and there were some things that I think for the American fan base in my in our older age group there's lots of new anime but you know a lot of people don't think about speed racer or mm. you, you know captain harlock there are things that were coming to america in the 70s and 60s that we didn't like speed racer we didn't know I, a lot of people watch speed racer and they didn't know it was an anime which is crazy but whatever um 
it, so when Robotech came along, it had a plot line where the good guys didn't always win, you know, like bad things happen to good people. And, you know, you're watching this and you're, you know, the such a weird juxtaposition to watch GI Joe where somehow everything blows up and everyone shoots at everyone. And the worst that happens is everyone has a, uh, you know, an arm and a sling at the end of an episode. And then you have Robotech where there's intergalactic problems, which include the good guys having personal relationships that don't work out or do, or get really complicated. Uh, the good guys having friends that are like, oh, they're going to make it. Oh my gosh. The main character just, you know, one of them just died. And so it was a weird, all, everything about the show was more realistic, but the issue of having something as big as a intergalactic spaceship crashing was enough for everyone to go we need to stop fighting and arguing about religion and global like there should be no global conflict we have an intergalactic issue and i think if you had an education where uh globally you had students that were able to actually cite oh well asteroid 6179m is in this elliptical orbit i think mm -hmm. if we were more aware uh, from a young age on of not only our health, but of solar and galactic and un universal issues that were, you know, are being hidden possibly by already monitoring this from a moon base and, or there's, you know, already some interplanetary archeology span going on, you know, where, this moon base that you're talking about or that other people have been talking about that they've been actually aware of all these things, but, Oh, well, well, let's not worry the public. You know, we don't have an ability to stop any of these. I mean, that's the argument, right? Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not gonna be able to stop it. So don't tell anyone. Well, but if you told everyone, I think maybe my hope would be of a more Robotech society where it's ultimately like, Hey, we have bigger things to worry about as than whether or not you agree with me on religion or politics. I agree completely. We, if we had more of an exo type of viewpoint on things, everything would be different. But yet I go to, went to high school. Oh, I went, you know, obviously it was a long, long time ago, but, and, and everything I learned in school was wrong. And it was all propaganda. It was all propaganda about being a good American and working hard and dying. Remember, ask not what you can or what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. How socialist is that? <laughs> right. Um, you know, because I was always inspired by it. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, my family has a military history. Uh, my grandfather was a tank commander. I, I'm absolutely all for American, uh, uh, I, you know, the idea of any country's success and you know, the technology we're on now, right down to electricity can be largely credited to, um, you know, a think tank, including Steinmetz and Tesla, but it, we're talking about American ingenuity. I mean, I can, I could definitely speak for a long time on how amazing this land has gathered and garnered and, and helped um, the entire world. But at the same time, it's like, okay, we need to be focused on us. You know, the, I've heard a lot since the Super Bowl about a meritocracy and not, you know, destroying the American way of life, which I think is important. At the same time, wouldn't it be interesting if we all lived in a solar autocracy? I agree. It would I be, agree. it would be very interesting. It, but, I mean, here's the thing, the motivation uh, to get us off the planet. And in, like you said, let's tear it up. Like you launch from America or, you know, from Florida, you know, where, wherever we have a space station, Moscow, wherever, uh, where we're, and not Moscow, you know, where, where they're launching, whether it's on the uh, Asiatic continent or whether it's in the Americas or wherever, but if you're launching a rocket and you're able to, or a ship that's able to fly to, like you said, that for at an extremely low cost to get it into the atmospheric level where it's like, oh, well, we could just hit the first space station that's within orbit. And then from there, they can go to the moon 
and from you know like if we have more of a distribution center i mean if we're able to or like the spacex la spacex launch of mm -hmm. more even more um starlinks if we were able to launch a payload and the payload can be picked up from space and just basically it's just shipped from the moon you know you have a a system where you're just picking it up from not entering all the way from you know ground level distribution here i think obviously there's a lot of ways to reduce the cost but the goal is how many people do we get on you know moon base moon hotel moon camp mm -hmm. and then from there you know how realistic is it for us to get a further orbital space station i mean we always or, think or we already have you know right. two things just came to my mind like one is how do we get this stuff up there you know we just started, started out talking about those balloons right what if we put payloads on these balloons sent them up just to the point where you know earth's gravity is not so intense where a ship could come down from the moon scoop up the payload from that balloon and take it right back to the moon Yes, that's a great. I mean, that's kind I, of. The, I mean, why, why is that? Why wouldn't that work? You know, I think with the balloon being made out of the right material, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, I don't know how fast it would be. Uh, somebody being a Joker, but you know, the Pixar movie Up. How mm -hmm. how fast would somebody stick an old guy in a chair to one of those balloons? Just to. <laughs> <laughs> just. Just to, I, I jump right to the funny. Sorry, guys. I think realistically, what you're saying, if the balloons are capable of carrying a payload worth, it goes back to that. You know, can we go from a, a hundred grams or less for a kilogram? Can we go to a hundred grand, a hundred dollars mm -hmm. a pound? But it just you makes know? so much sense, like because that would be like a, an area where you could launch a ship from the moon without having to, you know, thrust and break all the gravity of Earth. Come in. And just pick it up right before it gets stuck in the gravity of Earth and have to break it again. And then take it right back to the moon. I mean, we could transport people. We could transport goods. Maybe that's what is happening. And maybe that's been happening all along. You know, maybe there already is this base on the moon, like John Lear says. And, and that's how we're doing it. And maybe it's other countries doing it now. So we're trying to shoot their shit down or whatever. Right. You know? And, you know, as far as colonizing the moon, like people say, like, well, wouldn't there be people missing, right? You know, like, where's the basic people? We already know there's already a lot of people that are missing. You know, people go missing from the state parks and all of that, you know. Right. So maybe all those people are already on the moon as slave labor. Well, that or um, I've always been apt to think that people are much more motivated by curiosity. And, you know, if you're presented with an opportunity to leave all of your debt and what is really a, I mean, we could argue all, all day about the primitiveness of some of the ways that we're told mm -hmm. to live. Oh. And if we were to be presented with an opportunity to explore the universe in a way that no one is except in sci-fi films, how many people would have just gone quite willingly? I would have. That's true too. We wouldn't even need slave labor. People catch people like kind of like that movie Squid Games. So you get people that are sort of desperate and, not, and stuff like that and give them, hey, here's this great opportunity. I we'll have no debt. You don't have to worry about eating, anything like that. Yeah. Well, it's also old, it's old man's war. Um, you know, you don't know why you're leaving the earth, but uh, you don't you don't join up till you're 65. You don't mm -hmm. actually enter service till you're 75. And all anyone knows is you're cured of your ailments and you go serve off world within the galaxy at one of the new settled planets. And all you know is you serve for two years. And if you live like a, like a Roman soldier, you never get to come back to earth to tell anyone what happened, but you get to have land and settle and live indefinitely somewhere else in the universe or in the galaxy. So maybe there's a situation where they're offered that kind of experience and they're they're left to do it but high risk i suppose i would know. take you right well and you know i want to draw back on one of the things that i think is typical in the way that we look at aliens or we look at some of these i think very primitive narratives where people are like 
aliens came here for gold or, you know, and gosh knows everyone who hasn't heard me say this, who I'm sorry, or you'll be interested maybe, but for those that have, I apologize, but it's so important that we understand that if you're an interdimensional space traveling, anything, you have control of subatomic particles mm -hmm. and maybe antimatter and maybe, you know, multiverse stuff. But the reality is that we have 3d printers now that are printing, you know, skin cells, meat, um, we're building structures out of atoms or subatomic particles. That's how quantum computing works. The idea of spintronics. Spintronics is quantum computing and it's the th it's a theoretical state. That's what we're using and we're calling it, we're calling quantum computing spintronics. It's the same subject. But by setting an electron, the spin of the electron determines it being a one or a zero. I'm just reducing this to move forward quickly, which is you have uh, a quantum computer holding information through spinning of electrons. So we were in 2007 taking hydrogen atoms and building maps of the world, uh, putting books on absolutely tiny bits of fragments of just absolutely I mean, atomic levels. Mm -hmm. So making gold, uh, building any kind of metal, if you have control of the quantum world, you can take any amount of any uh, particle out of the ether and make those subatomic particles into whatever you want. So whether it's gold or diamonds or riches, you don't need to go anywhere in the universe and dig it up. You just don't need to do that. The argument is, well, you'll never be able to build a quantum printer that could work fast enough to build you anything bigger than a chair or a, a, a car or a sofa. You know, there's an argument that says, well, you don't understand, like, you know, you can still go around the universe and find massive deposits of fill in the blank. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think if you're interdimensionally traveling, you're also in control of the, the, these things beyond quantum computing, you're, you're using 3D printers so I'm tying all this into your point about, or our point about going into space with payloads. I think people are always going to be a payload. You know, we're not going to be not, we're not at Star Trek levels yet. However, I wonder if a lot of what can be made is either something that can be grown like uh, bricks. You and I have talked about uh, our asteroids really, are some of them actually satellites? Are they actually right. sending signals? So how much of the material do they need versus like, well, I got a pouch of our starter bacteria for growing building material and I have a pack of our starter material for growing whatever else. And how much of those payloads are actually um, a part of that, if not quantum computing level of understanding, but uh, the bacterial level, it's like, well, we can grow bricks and we can grow whole buildings from this, you know, very resilient space, uh, not sensitive uh, bacteria. And what if the payloads are much smaller? What if they're just duffel bags of some uh, nanotechnologies that once in space or on the moon are able to use the materials even on the surface of the moon mm -hmm. as you know building blocks so how much of the moon's surface is actually a raw material like a lot of people have seen around the country semstone so i'm uh now i'm getting a little too excited about this i should i should calm down here right mm -mm. <laughs> keep going well if we're i mean wouldn't it be interesting then though it's like the 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 3d printing you know, and I know there's been some experiments with concrete itself, but what if you don't need to bring a lot to the moon in order or anywhere for it to replicate and build itself? You could say, okay, well, at our current level of technology, we would need X amount of 3D printers. Um, so no matter what, we got to bring 100 3D printers, 20 of them cannot break. Uh, you know, so many can break down. Uh, and then we need somebody to run them. And then, well, it's going to take them at our current level of technology X amount of time to build the first bigger thing we need. Like, okay, well, we need a crane that arms around and can 3D print a building. Well, 
we're not going to bring the crane it's too heavy but to build the crane once we're there with the 3d printers is going to take at current levels of technology is going to take a year mm -hmm. okay well how do you get the setup and build time to a week or a month or two months or six months you know and then okay well now we have a crane well how long does that crane take to build a single building oh it can 3d print a building every week every month so then how many weeks until we have basic superstructures that when a team arrives you know they have homes they have secure locations you know like so there's i i'm very curious what the domino effect is of you know what's the deming effect what's our bottleneck to um achieving is it is it just multiple obviously it's multiple bottlenecks it's these narrowings of points in production that cause us to make it seem unrealistic. So one is current payload costs getting reduced to less than a hundred bucks mm -hmm. uh, for a kilogram. Then there's, okay, well, we still need to get equipment past the atmosphere that can be used in space. And it's got to be able to build other equipment. You know, where, where's our technologies with that? How long does it take to build a brick and bacteria? You know, I don't know. There's a number of layers. I get it, but I think maybe this ties into so let's just say we're already on the moon, right? And let's just say our technology is is more advanced than where it is currently. Um, is it diabolical to consider that what if what if from the 60s we never left the moon? The technology you and I are aware of were 100 years. Like Jim Goodall likes to talk about how he talked with Skunk Works, the CEO, mm -hmm. and, and and some others where... They're like, Jim, if you can imagine it, whatever you can imagine, we're 50 years ahead of that. I had so, heard 30. Yeah. And, and um, Jim heard it straight from, you know, one of the top dogs at the Skunk Works. So, and he heard it in person and in a, in a, in a you know, in a limo. And he just said, you know, and he asked about alien technology and he goes, to the best of my knowledge, <laughs> we don't have any alien technology. But at the same time, it was like, look, whatever you can imagine, we're 50. And, and Jim's like, I can imagine a lot. I mean, he's on his 30th book and he's like, we're 50 years ahead of what I can think of. And I'm like, that's one hell of a thing to say, right? But where I'm getting at is it just comes to mind now that we're talking. That's why we have these dialogues. Why uh, would they have not stayed on the moon and if that technology is where we think it is, what if they are further out? I mean, what if they're on other satellite moons around other planets already? I mean, what if they've already achieved that technology and, and already have bases or space stations that are on much larger orbits manned? It's interesting. You know, one of the things that I was thinking of when you were talking is something about like a bio nanotechnology where you know like how do we get this stuff up there and then build it you know what if we just drop off the um the bacteria or the cells needed on the yeah. moon and then we come back a year later and everything's already built for us they're programmable that's exactly the point it's like we already can program them and remote control them mm -hmm. and you tell them the structure you want to build and that's it. It's like, well, we got a monitor camera up and we have Wi-Fi or, you know, we have direct I mean, we, communication. We grow out of DNA, fucking carbon. That's it. It's all yeah. it is, carbon. And you end up with a complex human being. Yeah. So we should be able to do anything. Yeah, which is, I think, one of the big... It, it's kind of weird around the dialogue around... I know it's another digression. We don't need to go there, but the whole idea of cells not dying. I mean, they're all programs and the dialogue around the SENS Institute and longevity and, you know, it came up in some of the big world uh, British uh, news reports on occasion. And it came up just a few weeks ago about billionaires dare to want to live forever mm -hmm. i mean why even go with that angle other than the fact that i don't think anyone wants to die of cancer or 
or any terrible disease. I don't think, I think there's a lot to do on the planet. And then there's these weird romantic arguments about, well, you need to die because death is a part of life. And it's like, really, you're just the programming function of the cells that run you are, are basically, I don't know, it's not about a decline, like a decay, as in it's a natural process. It's a misprogramming mm. of those programs. They're just programs. I, I wonder, and, one of the things that I have has come up is the idea that we are already, we have the ability to be immortal, you know? And, yeah. and what has happened though is, is, you know, we've been taught about death from a very early age. So we believe it. Yeah. So we believe it. It automatically programs the cells to do it. Um, but some people say that during some of the other epochs that had happened, that people had the ability to choose when they were going to die rather than it happening hell. randomly like it does now. That would be a very interesting, um, that'd be one hell of a sci-fi book. Um, the concept around, I've, I, I mean, okay. I know maybe it's the way we're wired about questions, but you know, the big comment about, Hey, we know more about space than we do about what's under the water. The reality is we know as little about space as we do about what's under the ocean. And it's not only that, but something that I, you know, it's ending up in the news and you and I've talked about nuclear sedimentary DNA testing, but the very narrative that these poor, uh, fully rich, um, inst you know, collegiate institutions, the, it's all over the earth. We have like 5%. We have very little dug up of our past. And I, I, for those of you out there who need a new conspiracy, uh, go back to Tepe. They're only at 5% dug up. They've done nothing more and they built a parking lot for tourism. I've been to sites that have uh, incredibly fascinating data. And again, it's like, well, how much have you guys dug up? Oh, about three to 5%. And, and you have sites where they're trying to dig up more and it seems to be a magical number, three to 5%. It's like, well, we make some big assumptions about only getting three to 5% dug up and yet we have the dust of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of generations of information that is going to shift. Um, I think they already don't dig up my, my conclusion personally, or my, my working theory on the 5% is they don't dig up more because it would contradict every story that's told at every college and would ruin, well, they think it would ruin their reputations mm -hmm. to know more. But then we have nuclear sedimentary DNA testing where we're going back eons and, you know, you're in a cave and you're finding like where the Denise event, where they found 157 different species of flora, fauna, and animals in the dust. And that's just from a fraction of what's in that cave. So what, what's going to happen if you keep digging back to a, a very advanced ancient human society that didn't die, didn't want to die? didn't need to die and terraform the planet as such to be a giant functioning frequency energy. Uh, the technologies they were using appear so natural to us. We don't recognize them as biotechnology. And now, right. right. So now here we are realizing, well, you know, cells can be programmed and the DNA um, biggest joke on the planet. Yeah. We have 6,000 junk DNA. Really, really, really just you don't know what they do and you didn't know there was a double helix you didn't know there was a quad helix you didn't like the amount of information we don't know about just the human body i think combined with what i think we can figure out about our past is to re-engineer those programming cells and 100 percent consciousness is all dives that are there for those that want to explore there is a financial commitment there, but the moral and ethical idea of, well, how dare you want to live forever, all comes back to the big capstoning point I was trying to get to is 
How are you not curious? How are you not interested? You're, 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 everyone has a different level of consciousness. So yeah. for some, yeah. How many people, Gary, how many people have you met that are like, well, I'm bored? Everybody's freaking bored, man. That's why we have TV and <laughs> stupid cell phones and stuff. But and you make such a good point. Here, here we are as a society. Everybody's freaking bored, right? Yeah. But nobody knows where we came from, why we're here, and we just take this whole thing for granted. We don't explore it. We don't dig into it. We don't no. do any of that. We just entertain ourselves i just feel like it's time for us to like fade into nirvana here we are now it's so strange and and like the whole nano bioengineering technology what i i mean what if that's what this is that's maybe that's how all this got here to begin with i agree like even the whole planet i mean can you imagine if our origin society never even landed here they literally sent the payload and built this planet the way we just described? Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Like, what if that's true? Like, what? That that blows my mind. That really just blows my mind that that yeah, could have happened. And, well, and doesn't it I, I mean, some mind? of it kind of goes along with the theory of panspermia. But, you know, and I've always thought about that. Like, what if the panspermia was happened by an already conscious race? Yeah. And, and the concept, I think it's more of a, a benchmark of how are we digressing into potential sleep or oblivion is the more beings that are as complex as us, who can actually look at this world and go, I'm bored. Um, whether they're extremely wealthy and powerful or poor, we don't know anything almost about our own bodies let alone what's underwater let alone literally the dust floating around you is eons of information and then compound that by space archaeology and the fact that we could have ruins from mars to every you know any irrelevant exoplanets every moon or abandoned space station Mm -hmm. or some of these hurling um large elliptical solar orbital uh, asteroids that we think are asteroids are actually like old satellite systems built out of those bacteria. How do you not want to know that? Or if you master one skill, there was, um, I don't know if you knew this, in the League of Nations, there was one ambassador that could speak every language. At the time, there was like 67 or 63 nations. And this man could speak, well, he could speak every language. Wow. Or, or, or of, of the number of countries, maybe it was 120, but either way, he could speak 63 or 67 languages fluently with each of these countries. And uh, we have very, very, I think individually, I'm, I'm banging, I'm uh, giving my, I'm, this should be a motivator, not a downer, but I am kind of like being critical of my own self where it's like, there's a lot of things to master. And it's like, get on with it. And then each thing that you, you're, even if it's not mastery, even if it's just a personal hobby and interest, I think that it helps expand your mind to be open to seeing the other mysteries. And I think whether it's a drive or a passion or just a, a, a conscious effort to not want to have a lifetime that includes the time necessary to, um, master or at least ask yourself new questions at what point do you think you've lived enough to what the arrogance of it right the like, like, like we could do it. that in 80 years right no <laughs> yeah and 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 it's not just a matter of rinse wash repeat it's like okay yeah well, we so, don't even try it's... no it's it's not like well what are we going to do you know you're just asking the same questions and then we're going to have a bigger human empire and it's really just going to be like the same trade questions and the same. No, I, I think how do you stop? Okay, one, it's like, how does something go supernova? Um, what's really the quantum information about that? 
Would we ever want to stop a planet from turning into a red dwarf? Do we, we literally live on a planet with an expiration date blows my mind. Yeah. We, we, that no matter what you do to preserve this planet, it's going to die. Broken. Sun dies. We die. Yeah. So this planet is not cruising towards a day where we sit at the restaurant. I love the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy in the book at the restaurant at the end of the universe, where you get to sit and watch the universe explode. <laughs> <laughs> like while you eat dinner with a cow that talks to you. I, I I would love to be on the precipice of that restaurant as you're watching the earth about to get burnt to a sizzle and everyone going, oh man, everyone really did a good job recycling. You know, it, again, not an excuse to ruin the planet. It's more of how do we consciously um, manage galactic resources, universal resources to expand uh, on every level, whether it's multiverse consciousness. I mean, how do you not have a drive? Okay. Irrelevant. The, the, the point isn't so much. Why would an individual say after 60 or 50 years, they're bored. I think it's a, I, I think it's a very primitive bravery point to say, I don't have a choice. I'm going to die. So the flag in my pride uh, on the on the field of my pride is I'm going to plant this. I bravely go into the darkness because I've lived I've lived as long as I could. I've seen a lot, so I've I've lived well. And it's like it's an it is a noble thing, or a uh, it's good to show bravery and encouragement for the rest of us. But I don't think any of us actually want to just die. No. And, no. and there's, I, I, I also don't think that most of us believe that we just die. I think there is something that's innate in human that knows that we are eternal and omnipresent. Yeah, I do. I, I agree. So the, one of the fast, quick, primitive arguments immediately from people is, well, you don't die. You move on. You, you do. You don't. You have to go to the next thing. And it's like, I don't think we built ourselves to go on to the next thing in eight, 80 years or 100 years or 120 years. I think we may have built ourselves to go indefinitely, if at all, and in uh, hundreds or tens of thousands. Or th I mean, there's a reason you have the Methuselah and Jared in the Bible at 1,900 something years, mm -hmm. 990, whatever. And then you have the uh, Sumerians Kings list with tens of thousands of years with eight rulers. And I don't think it's an uncommon thread. I think it's part of our collective consciousness that we did have indefinite lifetimes and maybe there, and then the concepts of Buddha of ascension to a greater consciousness. I don't know if we did this in our unconscious mind that we just shut down, died and we didn't consciously go into another existence. That's the other thing that's terrifying. We we were saying there's this nat that it's a natural transition, and I'm wondering if it's just a broken one. And even though it's part of a transition, those are some of the scary things. It's like, are we really going into that conscious, uh, infinite expanse consciously, or because we're so primitively reduced and in safe mode? Are we actually like mm. dying and being even dumber? You know, <laughs> or it makes sense. So like, like maybe that's part of the whole safe mode routine that you you talk about so often. You know, instead of like, like you know, we reach 80 years old and we're dying instead of reaching 80 years old and progressing to higher levels of consciousness where we can right. be more productive, you know, have even more experiences. Yeah, and so it's um it's an interesting subject and it's pretty clear like it's pretty clear that the programmable nature of human dna and the potential unlimited consciousness aspect or that we've already been there based on the higher technologies we keep finding in our ancient past that we aren't i don't think we should go so effortlessly into the night i think we should go with a fight and i think part of that fight is uh doing everything we can to expand those consciousnesses and really encourage everyone to be curious about curiosity yeah 
Yeah. About there's so many things to learn and it doesn't mean you have to retain it, but that curiosity, I think is part of an engine of vitality and youth. I'm not saying it's a solution, but it's, but there's something in the ether, I think collectively in the human consciousness, that's um, I hope it's not diabolical, but um, numbing your mind and saying, well, I've bought every car. I've bought every building. I've bought every mansion. I've bought every book. I own every movie. I'm bored. Um, you're literally doing life wrong. That's just a short, quick, not a criticism, but you can correct it because each of us are unique, amazing, wonderful individuals that have unlimited potential. But if you've reached a point where you think you're bored, you have gotten in a rut. They, that maybe that's the termination switch. Maybe that's right. why people are dying because of that boredom, not yep. having the curiosity. Curiosity keeps us going. The boredom switch kills us off. Yeah, and I don't think curiosity is for curiosity's sake. I think it's for everything we just talked about. It's for that consciousness expanse, that enjoyment, that that not an overwhelming, but an, an inclusive, uh, uh, greater consciousness that allows greater pleasure, greater insight into yourself and the universe around you. I think there's amazing levels of like, right now we take drugs and uh, there are people who have said, you know, ayahuasca this or peyote that, or, mm -hmm. you know, psychedelic this. And there's this connection that they experience that are, you know, the, 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 how are we calling them? I guess the psychedelic astronauts are, you know, they're, they're very much on the plane of, you know, this is a, this is a good thing. I've been covering but, a lot of that lately. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just don't think it's something that's, I, I think it's something that's beyond what even that seems to be. I think it's banging on the blinky board. I think it's achievable through this curiosity and mm -hmm. not just mentally learning, but there's something, some, something between the heart and the collective consciousness and your expanse individually that keeps you young. I'm not saying it will physically yeah. keep you young. But maybe, maybe, but maybe, maybe if we bang on that blinky board enough, Eventually, the pinky board will just stay lit. Right. And then we just hit light speed. Mm -hmm. uh? You know, I mean, hit that blinky board from every angle. Hit it with psychedelics. Hit it with the curiosity. Hit it with the meditation. Hit it with yeah. the, you know, experimenting with things like the Wim Hof method. Hit, hit it with as many freaking things as you can. Yeah. And maybe we'll finally just knock that circuit back into place and it will stay on. Yeah, that would be, that's, that's a great place for us to uh, get back on this regularly. I know I promised a book. I am quickly coming to a printable version, a hardcover color, new version of not aliens got Belize. I, coming I need up. them for, I need them for Easter. Uh, that, that, that is exactly the right gift for Easter. If forget eggs and chocolate, this is, this is going to be your Easter gift. And uh you know, we didn't get to a Belize trip yet uh, for an expedition that I'm doing in April, but man, uh, I am sorry we didn't get to this sooner, huh? Hmm. I missed this. Yeah, me too. I just think we uh, we had to realign some stars in our individual paths, and I think uh, I think we did that. Got to slap out of this. This is uh, our, our blinky board went out for a while. <laughs> It did. <laughs> <laughs> you got to start pounding on it again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at the crap we came up with in barely an hour. Right? I mean, <laughs> I mean that, that's what, you know, we, we've covered everything from, from balloons to immortality. <laughs> this is all Gary's fault. It started with one question about balloons and look where we end up with. That, intergalactic that. consciousness expanse <laughs> of the human and immortality and all because of a balloon a balloon it's all it took was a bunch of hot air uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're um i mean if you think about that it's uh yeah it, it we yet put another stamp on everything imaginable <laughs> a bunch of hot air <laughs> yeah well okay <laughs> 
on that on uh, true but we did cover biotechnology programming cells sedimentary dna i mean payloads cheapening and or the existence of already uh far out moon bases that have expanded beyond the planet i mean we i mean everything imaginable we did we did that is why i am better than joe rogan uh you know what good for him for being so uh diplomatic about some of the stuff he covers with uh the people breathing down his neck about mm-hmm. what he should or shouldn't talk about it's i think he's navigating that he does he well. does do a good job with it you know he, he he's very good at staying neutral and curious um yeah and i i think it's pretty clear to all of us that he has some pretty deep and interesting thoughts on exactly the stuff we're talking about but then uh but he the can't war- get them out yet can't. Yeah, for some of the he, mob he's that is held happening. down by the man. Yeah, and 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 I I just like that he's able to manage it um, despite those those issues. So, um, I interesting guy to talk to. Is he as interesting as us? Well, that would be an interesting episode. Just <laughs> just <laughs> on. Um, What's your, uh, well, that I'm, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a pretty great year. I think we only have more stuff to do. I, I do want to come back and uh, talk about, I mean, mm-hmm. obviously we should get back on our regular, regular schedule, but I do want to get back and talk to you about um, this expedition we're planning. And uh, uh, there's one thing to discuss things. And it's another thing for, you know, one of the things that, I've always liked to do is get out in the field and we're, um, we're going to be doing some ancient engineered soil experiments and we're going to be, um, uh, doing some LIDAR work and I'm, uh, looking forward to talking to you about it next time. You know, one of the things that I've talked about recently too, we, we just a little off uh, sort of on the same subject is, um, and this came up during the episode of, about psychedelics and, and mushrooms and, you know, how mushrooms, have terraformed the planet essentially like fungi is what really started life on earth and this fungi has the ability to create communicate everywhere yeah you know and and it also does have pto electric properties right so uh, so so you know, is, is that part of what happened here? Is that how it was we got seeded to begin with? Did it all start with just fungi? You know, you got to wonder if, again, if you have an intentional bio network and you're starting big or you're starting like global, then if you're programming it, you need engineered soils that are going to be conductive or conducive for um, bacterial and mm-hmm. fungal networks. And if you're terraforming a planet, to be a functioning unit and you have giant earth circuits like the Nazca lines. And why would you not make it conducive? Again, if you're starting big uh, global um, freeway, or if you could start with one section of it and it can grow faster, if you're doing it all in stages and maybe you get one whole continent or, you know, um, the physical continental above water work you get so that that fungal network is again that layer programming is mm-hmm. done so that trees and the interspecial you know, space uh, species connection and the uh, walking human on the planet is going to need this underlying network so wouldn't you would you you know when you send the bags of bacteria slash what you're going to need to program and start that planet is it is it really microscopic and do you, and does that expand exponentially out as part of a base underlying connective grid i is think that, so i think it does yeah. and i also don't think it's any coincidence that that certain fungi when we take them attach themselves to receptors in our brain giving us for consciousness i don't know if um as we look at the functionality of inter, you know, the connection between the fungus, the fungus, the trees, other plants, like 
uh, Susan Simard's work out of, you know, British Vancouver. And mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder what we're really going to re-engineer. You know, we know it's so funny. It's like running our feet across a carpet and going through static electricity. It's like, oh, it's really good when we connect to the earth. You really, that's our, that's our 14%, 10% consciousness thought. What, what, what would we have already figured out? If we figured out all this other frequency and energy technology, what did a prior, more advanced, more human programming uh, group come up with? If they know that that fungal network, that bacterial network, this, you know, all these electromagnetic properties with these engineered soils, not to mention seismic meta materials that we're looking at and going, no, that's just sand. That's just a beach. You know, what, what was this when it was tuned really, what was this planet and us and that, that environment really capable of? It's pretty mind blowing. It is, it is. So I didn't mean to jump off into another topic. I know you have to go, but dude, it has been great talking to you again. Yeah. And um, I think we have to pat ourselves on the back. We, we had a lot going on the last few months. Um, not excusable. We need to stay on this permanently and uh, we're going to have to talk off air. You have to. All right. Well, thank you. And before we wrap it up, your website. Uh, notaliens.com is getting a facelift. It's, it's, it's coming along. So notaliens.com, the new book, uh, the new version of Not Aliens is coming out soon. It will make, it will make uh, Easter. It'll be in color and then uh, look for some new documentary work coming out over the next few months. So thanks for having me. All right, man. Well, thanks for being on. And I'll put a link to your website and in this episode and hang on for a moment while I play the outro.